Very good. So you were just discussing, I've got a couple of bean samples here. Um, can you see those? Yes. Those are Jacob cattle bean. They're, they're, again, they're a dried bean. They're really easy to grow. They grow as a bush bean. And if anybody wants, I have some extra to share. They're anybody beautiful. Some, let me know and we'll, we'll work a deal. I definitely want to swap for the purple potted pole beans. And I've also got a few samples here of, this is the, um, you can't really see them well. Oh yeah. I it's can a scarlet see. runner bean. So it's, it's a lot bigger. It's a lot bigger than the Jacob's cattle. And it's a dry bean. Um, it be looks beautiful when it grows and then it's, you get to t eat it all winter. Do you have to soak those before you plant them? Yes. Okay. Aren't you with most beans? I don't know. Like I said, it's my first bean year. Some of my beans I had to soak, some I didn't. My edamame, I don't think I had to soak. Yeah. Well, maybe someone had more information, but I think it's probably can't hurt overall. <laughs> Welcome to the Zoom, never Zoom garden plot, everyone. Oh, see, Sarah doesn't soak them. Welcome everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome, welcome back. Hello. I missed everybody last week. Was anybody else missing uh, our Monday night meeting? <clears throat> oh yeah, right. For the yeah. due to the holiday. No, I could. I could I, we didn't I, have I, one. I could have used a, a day off, a Monday off, but we'll get, we'll talk about that later. All right. Here's the agenda. We got questions and answers. I think we got a lot of questions and answers today. That's good with pictures. Weekly updates with Bill and Steven. <coughs> and we're going to have a little uh, mulching presentation or discussion. And I guess, Steve, you let us know if you said you might need to leave earlier. So yep. give us a heads up you right. know, when you need to start by. I was going to say, Steve, when do you want to start your presentation part? I've got this. I cut all your oh. pictures into three slides. Yeah. So, so. I can do it anytime um, up until what time is it now? It's uh, up until like 8 15. Oh, all right. Do this. We'll, despite the agenda that we just showed, we're <laughs> going to move the, uh, the presentation uh, up to the beginning. And then Michael, and then if Michael can anybody hear me? Yes, Jeff. Yes. yes. Because yes. I can't see anybody. All I've got on my screen is a thing that says connecting. And the circle is going round and round, and it's been doing that for about seven minutes. Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe leave and come back, maybe try a... Uh, right. All right. Restart the program, see if that helps. Shut it down and then restart it. Okay, hopefully I'll come back. And we'll see you. <laughs> um, so do you want to start with the presentation, Michael, or uh, a question or two first, or uh, what do you say? Cool. Let's um no let's let's make sure Steve has time to say what he wants. It's nice of him to uh, send all the pictures and uh, do his weekly update. Let's let's have him do that first. Okay. Oh, so and, just for starters, so I, I don't have a formal presentation. I really just thought this was going to be a kind of a general discussion about the use of mulch and some weed suppression. So I'm happy to talk about it. So the pictures that you're seeing um, on the on the left hand side, that's my peas that. That I took today. They're about two feet high, my climbing uh, edible snap peas. And right underneath them, you'll see some straw. And so that's, that's what I use for weed suppression around the peas. That is easy straw. I buy it in big bales from, I don't know, Lowe's or Tractor Supply or someplace like that. Uh, it's treated with guar gum. So when it gets wet, it gets a little sticky and holds together so it doesn't blow away. I found it really effective as a, uh, as a mulch. Um, it's great for um, retaining moisture and keeping weeds down. And uh, yeah, I just, I've been using it for the last couple of years. I'm very happy with it. I use it in all sorts of applications. I've got it on my herb bed. Um, once my potatoes, which you'll see in that same picture on the left, just to the right side of the picture, that's one of the rows of potatoes. Uh, as they grow, I will hill them up, and once it's fully hilled up, um, I'll throw a whole layer of mulch over that, throw that easy straw over that, and uh, it just makes life a whole lot easier. In the center picture, we have a raised bed that the only thing that's growing in it is one asparagus that 
seemed to have made its way from my asparagus patch. Um, but that's showing the use of uh, leaf uh, as a mulch. So what I did in the fall is I collected my leaves. Oh, sorry, Steve, one second. Sorry, sure. could you guys just mute uh, the phone when you're not talking, please, in the background, just so. We good? So um, what, you're, what you see there is a raised bed with about a couple of inches of leaves. And I put those down in the fall. I haven't planted that bed yet, but as you can see, there are almost no weeds growing there. There are a couple that are popping through, but it's a great, um, it's a great use of mulch uh, to cover areas that you haven't worked yet or you don't plan to plant until midsummer. Um, I've got this in the open areas outside of my raised beds. Oh, probably half of the garden right now has got leaf, leaves covered it, covering it. Um, somewhere along, I had a picture of that too. Um, but anyway, the, the furthest to the right is asparagus, and that's also today. And so now you see the asparagus. These are about four feet high, five feet high. They're starting to fern out. I'm still picking it a little bit. Um, if I get a cluster that's got five or six good stems that are, uh, that are fringing out, and I'll still pick some of the new ones that come in, but I'll only pick it for about another week and then let it all grow into its full um, full uh, ferns. And then I'll have to stake it. I usually put uh, stakes on each corner and then run wires to keep them from falling over. And I leave it like that. I think we talked about this a few weeks ago. I leave it all the way until the fall till it all dies back. And then I just go through and hack it off at ground level. And then I mulch and, uh, and that's it for the season. So there we are. Uh, so I have a question. Oh, do, do you want me to wait? I'm going to be really quick with this. So here, here's another part of the garden on the left showing all <clears> the <throat> leaves that I put down in the fall. And you can see how much it's suppressed the weeds. Um, so if you use a tiller or if you're just using a fork to turn over your soil, um, you're already in pretty good shape because here we are at June and other parts of the garden that don't have this already have those uh, pernicious, I don't know, what kind of uh it's it's something like a uh canadian or canada um somebody help me with this it's a thistle type plant and i don't know if anybody else has this but we have tremendous amounts of this thistle pops up it's got eight ten twelve inch roots i'll get to that in a minute um but anyway this this section with the leaves on it it's been very effective keeping down the weeds and keeping the moisture in the ground the downside of that is the ground stays cooler. So if you want to plant tomatoes or other things like peppers that are going to need warmer weather, you want to be raking that off and letting your ground warm up sooner. The center picture is my uh, blueberry patch. And that's a mixture of leaves and uh, pine straw that I just <coughs> rake from under pine trees because it gives it a little extra acid. And again, keeps the weeds down really well. And then to the right, that, that pea and bean booster. I know you guys were talking about peas earlier. I don't know if anybody, or uh, beans earlier. I don't know if anyone else uses this, but I found it very effective. Um, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a bio product. What is it? Uh, I've got some notes here. I wrote it down. Let's see. It is, I don't even know what it's called, but anyway, it enables your roots to uh, convert free nitrogen and I planted a row of peas using the bean booster and I planted another row without it and there's a significant difference. The, the one with the, the booster is probably eight to 10 inches taller and much healthier looking than, than the other one. And you can get that in all the garden stores. It's, you know, three bucks and it's just a little granule thing. It covers, I think, uh, 40 feet of row in one little package. Somebody had a question. Oh, oh, and this is, here's the garden. So the far right uh, is the garden that I showed you two weeks ago. Uh, that in, in starting in the bottom and going up, you've got, um, I've got, uh, what have I got there? Kale, red lettuce, spinach, yellow lettuce, collards, bok choy, and then a repetition of everything. And then the far left is as of today. So it's about two weeks difference there in that raised bed. And then in the middle is that thistle. 
So there's, there's one of these, I believe it, I, as I said, I think it's called a Canada thistle, pernicious, nasty weed. I have hundreds of them and I've just been pulling them out uh, before they go to flower because they go very quickly from flower to seed and then you'll have a million more in your garden. Um, and you can see that root, I put a tape measure there. That root is actually 10 inches long and that's just a typical, and I, I probably broke it off at 10 inches. So that's like a typical root. They, they go 10, 12, 14, 18 inches. And there you go. I think that was it for the pictures. Well, I have a question. Sure. So, uh, well, I guess I want to comment, first of all, on the thistle. I have them as well, and it absolutely drives me crazy. And all, I just, you know, every two days I'm out there pulling them, pulling them, and I notice that the more I pull them, the less I have year after year, but I still get them. I feel like, you know, the, maybe the seeds, they kind of blow into the other uh, garden beds. And anyway, there's a certain area. So I, I, I um, commiserate with you, uh, yeah. frustration with that. Uh, and the thing I want to ask you about is in the very first slide when you talked about the uh, straw that you get from either Lowe's or yep. um, Tractor Supply. What I, uh, you know, Jack has gotten close to mine, and and it just seems that the grass there seem grass seems to grow from it. Even there's seeds in it. Do you find that as well, or no? Well, I had the problem by buying straw elsewhere that had a lot of seeds in it, and then you will get you will get wheat growing. Um, but it's usually midsummer before they're really sprouting and you can usually pull them up because wheat grows pretty fast and tall and strong. With this stuff, it's, it's chopped straw. There's very few weed, uh, very few seeds. Um, so I really haven't had a problem with it. I mean, maybe one bale, I'll have four or five, six plants, uh, wheat plants that come up. And I consider that, you know, below noise level. Absolutely. So can you just tell me again what uh, it, um, the brand was or the thing you said? EZ e straw, e letter E, letter Z, and then straw. And it comes in a bale and it's about, I don't know, 13 or $14. <clears throat> okay. Jenny? Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, Sarah. I've been using that. Um, I believe weight since carrying it now also. It's really handy because it's it's sealed in plastic, so you can use the car without having the entire car covered with with a bag. But I, I find it's good. Okay, that's that's great. Good, Jack. Do you have anything to comment on this? Because you actually are the one that buys it. Just hit your. <laughs> wait, you're on, hang on, hang on. You're on mute, Jack. Hit your space bar, and hold it like a walkie-talkie. Hold it, hold it. Okay, sorry. Uh, Steve, I didn't get where you purchased it from, the Easy Straw. So I think I got mine at Lowe's the last time. I bought a couple of bales there. I previously, I believe I previously bought it at, um, at Tractor Supply. Tractor, Tractor Supply it has Lowe's. it. Yep. And, and uh, as we just heard, it's also at Wadeson's. Yeah, and the Greenwood Lake Garden Center has it as well. I don't know if it's that brand, but they have a good similar stick, you know, that sticks right. and blow away. Okay, yeah, we have gotten it, uh, usually get it, it at uh, Tractor Supply. And Steve, I have one question for you uh, with the blueberries. Yes. I have 20 plus more plants in a fenced in area, and I have grass between them, and trying to mow with the narrow mower is a pain to mow. Cover the grass with straw. Okay. Someone please mute. Someone please mute yourself. Sorry. Uh, Hey, Jack, Jack, you have to hold down your space bar to talk. I was. I was holding it down. Anyway, uh, Steve, with, uh, with the blueberries, should I just put straw down instead of having the grass between the bushes? You're on mute, Steve. If you could um, get all that grass out and then heavily mulch, that's what I would recommend. Um, I haven't used the straw, you know, just because I, I use leaves because there's a lot of it. And I use the, um, I use the pine straw because I know it's, there's a fair amount of acid in that and that's going to help the blueberries. But whatever you can do to suppress the weeds around blueberries, it's very important. I think that the blueberries suffer by having, uh, having to fight the weeds and the grass. 
Okay, I'll give it a shot. Thanks. Two, two things. One, to piggyback on that about the blueberries with the grass, you can wet cardboard, right, and lay the cardboard on top of that area so you don't have to do the manual backbreaking work of pulling out that grass before you straw on top of it, just as a suggestion. And then question for you, Steve, regarding, um, this is my first year growing potatoes, and they look great right now, but I know I have to be really diligent about making sure that they're covered the whole time right um so when you said you were going to throw more hay on top of them i've seen people do it where they put them right on top of i uh the stems before they flower is that what you're planning on doing steve everyone it's steve you're on mute Sorry. um i i put everyone on mute because somebody was having a problem so you have to take yourself off mute to talk Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, so what I what I do is I plant in trenches. That's how I, how I plant the potatoes. And when they get about six inches tall, I hill them up. In other words, I pull in some of the soil from the side so that the stems are pretty much covered and I just have a little bit of green leaves. And then in another, I don't know, four, three or four weeks, I will hill it again, usually about three times until the plant is actually about 12 inches tall, but there's only about three or four inches of green showing. Then I mulch it with the straw, and then the green plant can continue to grow and grows into a nice full potato plant, you know, a foot tall flower and everything else, but it's already been mulched, and I don't have to worry about too many weeds. Did that answer your question? Yes, but I did mine a little bit differently. So they're planted more in like a Ruth Stout method where I really just kind of put the potato down and I made sure that there was plenty of m nutrients around it, you know, a little bit of compost, a little bit, bit of manure in it, um, and then heavily mulched would hang on top of that. So I'm at this point now where I, it would be hard for me to hill them just for how much hay is still kind of around. It's probably just gonna be more of me adding more hay to the top of them, I suppose. And then, but you're saying you can leave like just three or four inches exposed as opposed to like, there's probably a good eight to 10 inches out right now. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, so I, I would think that your method will probably work. I've never done that, but um, the main idea is to get from, from where the actual potato is, you wanna have, six inches or more of stem that's underground or covered somehow so that's where the new potatoes will grow they basically form from little uh little growths out out of the out of the root stem so i think it'll be good and Super you know cool. I'll, thank you for that i didn't know that they grow out of that yeah that's that's awesome thank you oh i have a question um i thought potatoes were far too tedious <laughs> and bothersome to grow again so I didn't bother this year, except obviously I didn't um, harvest all my potatoes from last year. So I have a lot growing. Um, what should I know about those? I've left them, I've built them up a bit, but is, is it healthy, unhealthy, okay? They're volunteer plants, that's awesome. That's just life at doing its job, right? Really, there's no downside to last year's potatoes? not to my knowledge a volunteer plan is always a little bit of a blessing as long as you want to regrow that item right i mean what do you guys think about that <laughs> well i've i've got it one bed where it's the third year now it's the third year where the potatoes are coming up and the first two that i saw i actually transplanted into a place where i want potatoes but potatoes is one of those things when they talk about rotating your your crops that's one of the things it's not supposed to be in the same place year after year and so that's with the nightshades, like tomatoes and um, um, bell peppers and uh, eggplant. So if, you, if you're planning to, if you're doing that sort of crop rotation thing and your potatoes are there for the, like for me for the third year in a row, then you're not really rotating your crops and you got to think about what you think about that. So like I said, when I saw them coming up, I thought, oh, great. I'm good. And I thought, I wonder if this is going to work. And they actually did transplant, which a little bit surprised me. Um, uh, and now there are a couple more coming up, and uh, um, yeah, I'll probably just let them go again. <laughs> but that is a consideration, I think, if you're if that's a concern. But as long as we're amending the soil, right, and the beds, I mean, I haven't, 
I haven't been gardening enough to, to really concentrate on crop rotation, especially in this plot. It's only our second year in the home. But if you're mending the soil, is that still a concern about replanting in the same area over and over and over again? Uh, I, we have a lot of potatoes and they do come up, like Michael suggested, they just come up at different places all around because I've moved to bed all the time. So I have some from last year, some from a couple years ago, and they're all over the place. One of the problems uh, could be that they carry diseases. And so uh, if those diseases are in the soil, it may cause a new crop to not do as well. Uh, I haven't noticed that so much, you know, in terms of a problem, but that's one of the potential problems. Very good. Let's um. Oh, um. Let's go on now to the uh, the questions we the, the that were submitted. I'm going to share my screen for one. And this is a follow up questions. If we recall, Arnold um, had a, some questions about his pear trees uh, for Jack, and the the pictures were shared later by email. And I'm going to show them now. Oops. Let me try that again. Um, Arnold, can you explain your question about the pear trees and Jack, can you respond? Yeah, hey, um, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, the, the problem has been occurring for a number of years and I think it, it's, it's more pesticide related. I live in a very, um, uh, in a townhouse development and so um, we're all very, close together were packed in like sardines and some of the neighbors who I've talked to and, they're, and they're, they're good people and but they have an aversion toward bees and weeds and things that grow natural so there's a tendency to use a lot of chemicals and pesticides and um, I, I, I think what's happening is that the trees are robust. Their growth is just spurting every year. I have to prune them down. Um, but their fertility, their ability to, you know, grow flowers uh, and so on has diminished. I used to have bushels of pears coming from these trees five, six, seven years ago. And uh, now, the last two years, I have had none. Sarah mentioned that it could be the frost. I, I, I think it's I think it's more of a chemical thing. So it's something that I might have to pursue on my own end in terms of uh, getting to know my neighbors better in terms of you know what they do to deal with their you know with with, with their lawns and and so on. But the trees are, are, are blooming, they're, they're green, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're luxurious, they just don't produce any fruit. And there's no bees. Jack, did you have some comment about this? Um, well, you know, comparing the two trees, you know, the one on the left and the one on the right, the one on the right, uh, you know, it kind of looks like it really needs to be pruned more, you know, opened up so the sun gets through it. Uh, you know, when you mentioned about, you know, pruning a lot, I know when I first, you know, acquired our property with the apple trees, uh, the farmer said, you know, you have to be careful in pruning. If you prune too heavy, you know, you could stunt, you know, the, uh, the fruit harvest. So, you know, that is a, the possibility also. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to drive by, and this is a suggestion, I forget who it was, but the, the suggested I drive by Pennings and, 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 and see how the fruit trees are there, are pruned, and so on. And yeah, I agree, it is kind of bushy. Um, it's not a tree that 
looks like it's meant to bear fruit, but it's leafy and it's tree-like. So maybe perhaps my own biases here are, are, are coming forward and thinking, well, maybe I don't want pear trees that bear fruit. Maybe I just want trees that look leafy and bushy and, um, and um, you know, maybe the whole pear question is not relevant anymore, but, you know, the, the lack that they're not fertile, uh, you know, it, it, it's still, you know, it's still, I don't know, bugs me. Arnold, um, do you have, do you know what the, the varieties of the pears are? Yes, they're Bosch and, uh, oh my gosh, the other one star uh, starts with a B as well. Is it Bartlett? Bartlett, yeah. Uh -huh. But <laughs> I forgot which one is which. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just, because, you know, if you said that they have blossoms, but there are no bees, they may not be being pollinated. Um, but the pear trees do need pollinators. You need to have two different kinds. So you have two different kinds, unless they bloom at such a different time that they, there's not going to be cross pollination between them. Um, so did you, did you say there are blossoms on both of them? No, they do blossom at the same time, approximately. Okay. And, but, but, but the issue is, is that years ago i used to have bushels and you know hundreds and hundreds of pears they used to fall on the ground they rotted they attracted bees uh but now now that's not happening anymore so well it could be that you don't have any pollinators that's a possibility right and that i could think that it would be because of the uh you know the pesticides that you know, the people right. around me are putting. Right. Can you tell us about this picture, Arnold? These are also from you. Oh. Yeah, this is just to show how robust the trees are during the winter. And uh, I think it was February. I, uh, I pruned and pruned and pruned, got up on ladders and snipped and snipped and snipped. So it's not like the trees are, 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 are weak. I mean, like I said before, they're robust in terms of their growth, but they're just infertile. And what's this over here on the right? Sorry, Michael, what was and what's that? This, this picture on the right, what is this? Oh, <laughs> well, that, that was, that was a, a, a hopeful a cure. Um, I took a course in creating bee um, nests at the community center by one of the people at the, uh, the, the, you know, the Warwick Community Gardens. I forget what her name was right now, but uh, we built these little, you know, wooden nail things and we put them in with, uh, we stuffed them with a cane or whatever, and they were supposedly to be uh, bees nests that bees would be naturally attracted to these things and um, and um, uh, you know the, Sarah perhaps you could address this I know that you were uh, involved in some way or at least aware of uh, these efforts to uh, promote uh, uh, bee uh, pollination Hi Arnold. I think Bernice gave the class. And yeah. The idea is that a lot of the bees need a place to overwinter. You're actually oh here comes the train. You're actually supposed to put them pretty close to the ground. But the bees are supposed to go in and hibernate in there for the winter. Um depending of course if you don't have any bees in your area anyway, there's no bees to go hibernate. Well, I don't have any bees now, but I used to have hundreds and, or thousands of them. 
You know, I would call up um, Cornell, the Master Gardeners. I think their hotline's open on Wednesdays and Fridays because they usually have people that specialize in various areas. And if they don't know the answer, they could give you a call back. And the other thing I don't know, but I've always been under the impression that fruit trees don't necessarily produce forever. I believe the orchards replaced their trees from time to time. So they may have run their course for producing fruit. Check with, check with Cornell. You got it, Sarah. I will definitely okay. pull up that uh, hotline. You say Wednesday and Friday? Wednesdays and Fridays in the morning, they're there, I believe. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So, uh, so Arnold, sorry, in the spring, Arnold, did you see flowers on the, on the tr trees, you said? Uh, yes, but nothing like they were before. But you don't I see mean, bees. Yeah, I, don't, I wonder whether, I mean, you need the, the, the pollinators. Yeah, I wonder what the bees are gone. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I think it's pesticides. Arnold, you know, it could be what you said, you know, when you're pruning the tree, it looks like a tree. It, it, you know, it does not look like a pear tree. And I wonder, you know, if the way you're pruning it is affecting your uh, produce. I'm not sure. Something to look into. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that, definitely. I'm not... I'm not a pruner. I mean, what, what I've learned is from the, you know, community garden, so. I agree with Sarah. I would definitely check out with Cornell because um, I, I have heard trees will only produce, especially fruit trees for a small amount of time. But I had noticed last year that I didn't have an awful lot of pollinators in my garden and I winded up planting flowers in there. And that all of a sudden changed everything for me. And I saw so many bees and butterflies and everything jump in. But it was just that there's so much lush field to them to be around in that if you don't have anything quite ready for them, you have to kind of draw them in. At least that was my experience. I like that. I'll, I'll think about that. Plant flowers. Let's, let's move ahead to the next question. Um, oh. Karen, Karen submitted this, but I don't, I think I, uh, someone named Karen submitted this, but I don't believe she's here tonight. Let right, she said you sent that. Yeah. Do you know what her question is here, Chad? Maybe what's happening to her plant? Oh, okay. Let me see if I could find the email sorry on my kindle um but i guess you're right obviously there's some type of uh, brown spots but i'll see if she has the more specific question does does anybody recognize what what's going on with this plant well they're definitely rhododendron right i guess she's wondering why the let me see if i have there wasn't anything else on the email. Anybody know why we have brown spots on this rhododendron? Yeah, I guess that was the question to say, you know, why, why is that happening to our plant? But let me double check. No, we've we've got a lot of questions. Why don't I why don't I go on to the next? Yeah, one? yeah. No, I'll look. I'll look for that. And if somebody's jumping forward with an answer, then yeah. Ah, are those pictures clear? Someone saying I have spots on my tomato plants and I've never had them before. Are they are they clear enough? Do I need to zoom in on some of them? Yeah. What's going on with those plants? You know when the pictures were taken? You're Gail, you're on mute. This was these pictures were submitted by Gail. She was, looked like she was saying something, and now she stepped away. But she sent the picture in today. Ah. You know I've seen tomato plants get little white dots like that, just from um, rain and and. And strong sun on them. 
Gail? We can't hear you, Gail. Hmm? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, no. sorry, my son-in-law is helping me with a technical problem. I took those pictures today and um, I uh, maybe I was watering them from the top as opposed to the roots. I just heard somebody say maybe it's from water, but um, I never had those spots before on my plants. And also I had never really grown my own plants from seed. Do you know how to get the whole thing? Did they just appear? Yeah, when I planted them, they were um, some, many of them, many of them don't, but a lot of them do. And I just didn't know if they were diseased, if I should pull them out of my garden because a lot of my tomato plants don't have them or it's just wait and see what happens. Doesn't look like blight. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Thin and papery, the little white spots. There's some holes in the leaves too. Um, just small white spots. Yeah, pretty much over the whole leaf. I would give it a few weeks and see if the new leaves have the spots. Okay. If the new I, leaves have the spots, then I would be more concerned or start looking for pictures on the internet of tomato diseases. Okay. I also specific. Thank you. Um, also, I, um, when I, I took the middle picture shows a stem very close to the ground. Mm -hmm. Do I just leave that or do you generally remove those stem? I, I planted them pretty deep. I know you're supposed to plant them deep, but when a stem is that close to the ground, do you leave it or t cut it off? These in, well, I don't know, you probably can't see my cursor. I would get the rid of the ones right close to the stem, but they need to grow a little bit more before you prune them. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. This is Chad's question. When's the best time to put netting on fruit trees? <laughs> I have that question too. Yeah, I have like, you know, they're looking good and I have that little tiny peaches and little tiny apples. Like, should I cover them now or, do, or should I wait? Like, I don't want to stop any good, you know, birds and stuff from getting there, but I, don't, I also don't want them to get picked off. So when do you, when do you think is the best time to cover them with netting? Uh, if you're going to do netting, I would say, you know, the sooner the better while the fruit is still small as opposed to when it, you know, is larger and heavier. Uh, I mean, do you think, really, do you think netting is necessary when you said, if you said, if you're going to do netting, do I not need to do netting? Well, I don't like netting because when you go to take it off, the tree has grown since it was put on and it, it's just, it's a pain in the neck and it rips and tears and you know, I have fencing around the trees, so at least I keep the bigger animals out. And if the uh, birds are going to get some, you know, kind of so be it. All right. So you are, you're not a big fan. Yeah, I wasn't even, I got netting, but I don't, I'm, you know, I just don't, I guess this is the first year I'm really getting fruit. So I didn't, I don't, I don't have that much experience, but they, they did seem to pick me a little clean last year, but squir and mostly squirrels and birds. So I don't know if that, Netting wouldn't even be helpful, but but I should try it now. Okay. Is this the time to try it? Because I, I had a hundred percent of my peaches taken, um, <laughs> so I'm definitely going to try netting. But I have hundreds. You have you're supposed to thin them out, right? I mean, you don't leave all the um, fruit growing, or do you? I don't know. Uh you definitely want to thin them out. Uh, you know, I mean, if you have a clump of, you know, two, three, four, and they're close together, you know, I would, you know, knock half of them out. Mm -hmm. The only issue, I mean, now, you know, it's coming into June and there is a June drop. So, 
you know, I wouldn't, you know, prune too heavily now, wait till they get a little bigger and then prune. Well, prune, but I mean, remove the fruit, not prune the tree. Uh -huh. um, it, and then, you know, with the netting, you have to figure out, is it the squirrels or the birds that are getting the fruit? I mean, the netting, I don't know if that's really going to keep the, the squirrels out unless it's, you know, wrapped around the bottom of the trunk. Well, I'm going to try because <laughs> they didn't leave me one. I think it's the squirrels that get them. Gail, so someone mentioned that if you put individual bags on the fruits, that it's a lot of work. But what if you just did it for a couple dozen? So I, tried, I, I tried paper bags last year and it wow. didn't work. <laughs> I might have done it wrong, um, but it didn't work. You got to hand it to those squirrels. I guess They're smarter them. than me. <laughs> So Va Valerie isn't here, but we'll we will we'll report someone's answer to her. Everyone can read as well as I can. Somebody, somebody want to volunteer their rose expertise for this one? No rose experts. I've killed every rose bush we've ever gotten. <laughs> yeah, they're very uh, particular. That sort of comment is actually very helpful for, for some of us gardeners. Um, someone else I know said they've never found a fruit tree they couldn't kill, and they're quite successful gardeners. And they're actually on here tonight. And uh, if they want to stand up and say who they are, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, I do know they are, you know, rose bushes are very difficult. They're very susceptible to all types of diseases and things. I don't know the exact disease that's causing that, but it seems like it's kind of advancing quickly due to by, by what she's saying. It's unusual too because the holes in the leaves usually mean beetles, but it's it's too early for the beetles to be out. That she isn't here and nobody's jumping up to answer. Let's go on to the next one. And also we're getting close to the time where we're gonna to have to do our, our, our break. Um, the shimmy. Oh, yes, so we had three, we had several weed identification requests this week. Maybe, maybe what we can do is, since we had the presentation already, why don't we do the, um, the, uh, the shimmy in place now, and we'll do the announcements, and, and actually we'll let um, Steve also, did Steve step away already for the night? No, he's still there, good. Um, Steve kind of has to go, so I'll have him and Bill do their, just what are they doing in the garden this week? So let's stand up and shimmy, and we'll do the what's current in the garden, any announcements, and then any weed identifications. So shimmy in place, folks. <laughs> Okay, well, Steve mentioned he needed to go before too late. So if Steve, you wanna say what you were doing this week, that would be great. And you're on mute right now, so be sure to take your mute off. Okay. Yes. Okay, so, so this week, uh, Pretty busy week. I usually use June first as the uh, the date that I could start putting everything in the garden. So tomatoes went in, 
Uh, my potatoes, as I showed you earlier, are already in. I've planted corn and it's just starting to come up. Um, and I've got three different kinds of bush beans that I've got in the ground. And uh, everything's doing really well. And I'm just waiting for all the bugs to arrive, uh, which so far, so far, so good. But I know they're right around the corner. Um, that's about it. Keeping up with my mulching. Thank you. We've had asparagus beetles show up for the first time, and they're here already and in force. Yep. And um, does anybody know what is that a sign of? I mean, everyone says knock your asparagus beetles into a bucket of soapy water. Where we don't kill things, and so we're finding alternative. But what can I do to prevent them in the future? And I, I haven't heard of a thing that you can do to prevent them, but. What you, what you might do, Michael, is um, you could you could uh, knock them off into a little cup and keep a lid on it because they will fly away and then take them somewhere else and let them out. Not to Steve's garden, though. Yeah, not to my garden. But <laughs> I've, I've had a very light year with asparagus beetles. I'm very surprised. So uh, today I noticed maybe 10 on all my 50 or 75 plants. Um, so that's that's an amazing number. Now they will increase as the season goes on, but um, that's what I would do. I would just relocate them if you don't want to kill them. Okay. Another county. <laughs> and ex actually, that's another question. Like, how do how do those guys find my asparagus patch to begin with? I mean, m maybe they, there's other things in between asparagus patches that they eat, right? Or I think I, I think they found their way there, and they're in the ground and now they've emerged and they're there. Maybe try to get some praying mantises or uh, something. Yeah, you know, I know that they sell eggs that you could hatch at the garden center. Maybe having more predators might help. Yeah. You know, I've found that wasps actually like the larva. I've seen them come and pick them off. Hmm. Um, so predators are a good step. Uh, Otherwise, I just I just uh, pick them off uh, almost on a daily basis. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Sure. I'm going to check out, folks. See you okay. next week. All right. Bye bye. Or, Happy or, gardening, everybody. Hope it rains. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, do you want to give your? Yeah, I'll do it really fast. Uh, I planted out everything in the garden by now, uh, sweet potatoes and corn this last week, everything is out. And then we had a pretty cold night the other night. I, I ran out there and covered things and protected things, but it wasn't as cold as they said it was gonna get. Uh, I think that was last night actually, or the night before. They said 39 and, and it wasn't. Um, so anyway, um, what I'm doing in the garden is mainly mulching walkways. Um, you know, paper, uh, straw, uh, mulch from the town park, wood chips and stuff like that. Uh, I'm harvesting a lot of stuff um, already. Uh, lettuce, spinach, chard, radishes, kohlrabi, broccoli, and Chinese cabbage this week, plus asparagus. And I'm fertilizing onions and shallots uh, this week. They need to get a lot of growth on them this month because they're light sensitive. So they need to get to be big plants before they start to bulb up. Uh, so I have been uh, weeding them and then uh, fertilizing them. Yeah, question? Um, other than that, um, I'm about to mulch all of my beds themselves around the plants because we are having a kind of a drought right now in case you hadn't noticed. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of starting to do that. Uh, that's, uh, and if you do mulch around the plants, water them well before you mulch. So that's, that's important. Uh, that's about it. Anybody have questions for Bill? Go ahead, Gail. You're on mute. You're still on mute, Gail.
I can't hear her. She, she's on mute. She's trying to talk, oh. but we can't, no one can hear her. Okay. Okay. Sorry. My grandchildren are living with me because of the world situation and they asked for watermelons, which I've never grown. Is this the time to put those in or do I wait till it's even warmer? Um, it's, it's been cold so far as a spring. You could wait another week or two to make sure it stays warm. Mm -hmm. uh, look at a 10 day forecast, for example, and see if the temperatures are gonna drop down into the 30s or 40s over the next week or two, which is possible. Uh, but it looks like it's gonna probably be okay. And then we have a relatively short season here for watermelons. So I would recommend getting a small watermelon like Sugar Baby. Yeah, I did. Something yeah. like that. Uh, not one of the giant uh, 12 foot ones. So. And it said they like sandy soil. Should I um, add sand or it doesn't matter? Um, I found that I have very clay soil and they seem to grow okay in it. Uh, they need fertilizer once you, you know, once they start to produce. Mm -hmm. I would give them some fertilizer. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I don't really want to grow watermelons. <laughs> they take up so much space, right? Well, you put them on a on a on a trellis, right? Mm -hmm. You can put them on a trellis, so they won't take up quite as much room that way. And sugar baby aren't a giant. It's not a giant spreader. So if you're going to just do a couple of them, they're not going to take up too much room. And you could also put them, if you have a bed, put them at the back of the bed and you still have room to grow some other things in front, short things like lettuce or something else. Mm, okay. So it doesn't have to take over your garden. <laughs> That's a good idea, thank you. Sylvia, did you have a question? Go ahead. Do you have to unmute yourself? Yes. So I think my spinach, I'm the first, my first season. I believe my spinach and my mixed lettuce are ready to be harvested. So is there a special preparation after harvesting um, to cleanse them and then for storage? I've, um, some people put it in water and vinegar for any cleansing or just, just dip them in water, towel dry them, and then put them in the refrigerator. Any recommendations? Uh, I just wash them and I use a spinner to dry them, but they're still slightly wet. And I put them in a bag in the refrigerator, a closed plastic bag, and uh, try to eat them within a few days. Thank you. Pick them right for dinner. And the spinach <laughs> and the lettuce, you don't really have to pull up the whole head at one time. You can just go out and take exactly what you're gonna eat for that day. There's no need to, to store it in your refrigerator when you have it growing in your backyard. Yeah, you could clip the leaves as you go, you know, not, I wouldn't clip, you know, yeah. more than 20, 30% and then they, they'll grow back quickly. Right. How many, um, would you get like three or five harvests out of them? Yeah, you well, could keep cl clipping them until, it, until it gets really hot, then they're gonna probably what they call bolt. They're like, shoot, you know, you want to then you want to pull them because when it when it gets too hot, they just go to flower and then they're not really too edible at that point. So if you see if you see them starting to really grow and get tall, you know, then you pull them before that happens. But until then, you could keep clipping them, and you know, a few leaves here and there, and you could have multiple meals with as much as long as you could go go for. It. Yeah, I usually just clip the entire lettuce plant. I just cut it off at the bottom, leave it about an inch. And if you keep it watered, uh, you usually get another head coming out. It'll, it'll grow a whole new head. Um, you can also take off leaves uh, a little bit at a time. Um, with spinach, though, I, you don't want to like cut it off like that. I think you just want to pick leaves. I don't think if you cut it off that it's going to grow back that well. Okay. No. Spinach isn't, once it gets hot here, lettuce gets kind of bitter and your spinach, you pull out in the summer and put something else in and put it in again in the fall. Okay, good. Let's, um, I want to, I want to go to the announcements. Um, so one of the things we're thinking about is 
should we switch to doing this bi-weekly? Was it all on Monday work? And also, what about, you know, some people want to be out in their gardens. What about pushing back the start time to 8 p.m.? And maybe that would mean just going from 8 to 9. How do, how do people feel about this? Uh, I would vote for an 8 p.m. because as it gets hot, eventually it's going to get hot. Uh, the evening is a nice time to work outside. And so it'll be light till 839. So that, that's my working time out there if it's really hot. Okay. Do we want to keep going every week or is every other week better? I think by week we will garner more information without clutter. Okay. Yeah. That seems to be a yeah, so so bi-weekly in uh, eight, so just an hour from eight, it would be an hour instead of ninety minutes at eight o'clock starting time. Yeah, we appreciate very much what you're doing, but um, you have to get in your gardens too. So every other <laughs> week is probably fine starting at eight. Yeah, okay. I think that's a great idea. Um, I think the fact that we've done weekly so far has really gotten a lot of us to where we are now in our gardens and. You know, now that a lot more is going to happen, I think um, bi-weekly is fine from this point moving forward. And the eight o'clock start time sounds great. I, I a little bit wonder if like, you know, in spring when people are supposed to be sort of holding back and not putting too much out anyway, maybe that's sort of seasonally, we could be meeting once a week. And then, you know, once it really gets into the, when we're out in the garden, then down to, you know, every other week or, okay, but for, let's, let's plan to do that then. Chad, do you think so? Looks, looks like we had a consensus there. Yes, so bi-weekly and eight. Week. Sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. Very good, very good. Um, let's see, on, that's this Wednesday, um, the Post Carbon Institute is offering a, a webinar. They usually charge, it starts, it actually starts at 1 p.m., I think. Not one, 1, I think. One, yeah, I think one. Starts at one. If you're interested in that, email me or email Chad. And we'll we'll help you get signed up for that. And then a few of us are going to discuss it at seven o'clock on that's Wednesday night. It's called Recipe for Action: Building Food Security in Insecure Times. Yes, Post Carbon Institute. It's a really good organization, right? They usually charge money, but they they usually have some really good talks. So it would be interesting. What do they usually charge? They're, they're twenty five dollars. You know, donation. suggested yeah. donations. Right. Um, Chad, can you talk about the locavores map? Yes, yeah, so the locavores map. Hopefully, we're meeting again tomorrow. It's actually uh, taken on a bit of a life of its own. Uh, first, uh, Bill Green and I and Michael and all and stuff and Sustainable Warwick, we started, wanted to find a way to really link people up uh, with local farms uh, within 25 miles and break it up into categories. If you're looking for eggs, if you're looking for meat, you know, garden centers. Uh, so we've been compiling lists and trying to find the best category. It's really funny. The, trying to find the perfect categories is quite tricky. And uh, Orion, who joins us in a lot of these uh, conferences, we pulled him in with us, and he's super knowledgeable. And uh, right now we're just kind of fine-tuning the categories and uh, terminology. He, he, he gave us the term locavore and food sheds and all the different uses of, of words. But hopefully within a week or two, uh, we should have a – a really great map that you can go to a sustainable Warwick website and you know, it, have, it will take you right to the place on a Google map saying, you know, you want, you're looking for some eggs or some cheese or meat. So it'll, it'll it should be a really good uh, tool. And please, if you look at the map and you see anything that you, you know, either a farm stand that you know about that we could add, you know, please, there's a, there's a number, there's an email there to update the information and that would be great. And we're hoping to get, a very thorough map of anything than 25 mile radius. So hopefully this will be a big tool that we could use to really join farms together with people. In, in permaculture days, they sometimes talk about planning your, your, uh, your garden or your farm by the five zones, that your closest zone is, you know, things, things in like your furthest out zone, you do different things. I once heard somebody talk about the five zones in terms of, well, zone one was your own garden, but as far oh, so this, the zones in terms of building a local food supply chain. So zone one was your own garden, and I thought he was going to be all about 
you know, being self-sufficient, but that wasn't it. He says zone two is your CSAs and farmers markets that you, you know, you support your other local farmers who are around you. And then the next is uh, like farm stands and so forth. And then local, fourth zone was local um, grocery chain, chains, a regional grocery chains, that would be like ShopRite. And then occasionally if you, something from those doesn't seat your needs, then you go to like a Sam's Club or, or you know, something way out in the wilderness. But anyway, trying to, as much as possible, try to course, source as close to home as possible. So that local war map is gonna be on the Sustainable Warwick website. And uh, it's sort of, to me, it's the next step out from, your, from our own gardens is to go to, to that sort of resource. And, and, we, and we are blessed where we live in Warwick to have, I'm finding many, many places I never knew existed. So we have a real, we have a, just a, and a lot of them, you know, they're all very safe. They do pickups so you can call. So, you know, we try to give as much information as well on the, on the descriptions. And people have CSA, you know, there's a CSA starting in Greenwood Lake uh, this week with Blooming Hill Farms. I don't know if there's anyone in Warwick, but we're, we're going to list CSAs, farm stands, I mean, farmers markets. So uh, again, there'll be, a, there'll be a email there, or you could email me or Sustainable Warwick and, uh, you know, if you have any information or you have any questions. And then this last announcement, um, let's see. If you, Nicole told us about this. Now Nicole is not here. But if someone's interested in this, there's this company out in the Finger Lakes region um, and they have a container gardening mini course that's offered for free. And if you're interested in, in that subject, um, email me or email Nicole. If you don't have Nicole's um, address, you know, email Chad or I, and we will get Nicole on this and get, get the details off onto you. I know, it's, it's amazing. Almost now with this, with this unfortunate thing we're going through, almost every day, some great institution is offering just online workshops and docu-series and it's, I'm pretty much every night watching something, so it's, it's pretty good. Unfortunately, the circumstances are not great, but there's a lot to uh, go through. I, I have a question for the group, uh, and maybe somebody can help me. Um, I, ha I have some hot peppers, and I was going to grow my hot peppers in, um, in a pot this year, and I have a large pot. I took three pepper plants. Um, I took manure and compost and put that at the base level of the pot, and then I filled the rest up with potting soil. And then I put the, 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 the peppered plants into the pot. And I'm wondering if that was a good route to go. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Was the manure aged? It aged, slight, uh, mostly aged. Yeah, that, you know, that, you, that you, got, you just gotta be careful of that because that could, you know, kind of burn things a little bit. But how big is this pot, like pretty, very big or? It's it's big. It's a it's a cauldron. You know what I mean. Oh, okay. And I, and and like I said, I put more, just a little bit at the bottom, so maybe that it would reach through, or, or somehow you know the roots would get down there. And I and and I left most of the uh, most of it potting soil. So it was like maybe three inches of manure, and then like ten inches of potting soil. I think that should be good. I mean, in my humble opinion, but I'm sure someone else might have something uh, to add, I guess. Well, I guess we'll find, you'll tell us. Yeah, I'll tell, <laughs> you, I'll tell you how it, comes, it works out, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, I planted, the, uh, I didn't use that formula, but I planted peppers as well, hot peppers. Yeah, I'm hoping you for know, a good harvest. I, I've been working on these plants. I was tickling them the whole time they were in the trays, so they're, they're stout, you know? You know, if they don't look like they're thriving, Steve, you can, um, Spray, dilute some Epsom salts and spray it on, and it, it helps them perk right up. All right. All right. Epsom salts and, and, and what was the second thing? Water. No, Epsom salts and water, sure. Yeah. I spray it on the peppers and the tomatoes. Once they're, you know, after you've planted them and they get started, sometimes they, they get a little yellow looking and they don't seem to be really thriving. And I spray Epsom salts every few weeks, and I think it's magnesium in there, but they really like it. Okay. Um, do, you, do you mist or do you just go full on? No. I, I, uh, I put in a pump sprayer and just give it a couple shots. A 
okay. all over. Well, I'm doing a lot of them. But the whole plant, the roots, the... The foliage. Um, it's, a, it's a foliar, foliage. foliar spray. So it's okay. for foliage. And what, how, how do you dilute it? What's the percentage? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. In a <laughs> small pump spray or maybe quarter cup, half a cup of Epsom salts to a, a gallon or two or water. Okay. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, what I used to do, and, and I think this had something to do with magnesium too, is I used to take like uh, clam shells and put them in, in top of certain household plants. And they always seemed to thrive when I watered the, 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 the clam shells. You know, I'd eat, like I'd have baked clams, I'd eat the clams right. out, and I'd put the shells on top and uh, I cracked the shells a little bit and whatever was in the shells used to leach into the, into the household plants and it used to help them out a lot. I wonder if that's magnesium too. I'm not sure. I would, calcium. I would guess it would be calcium more calcium. More likely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and when do you, have you started the Epsom salts already? No, I mean the, the plants, well, we finally got our community garden going after our shut down so we just put the, the plants in this weekend but it's usually i'd say three or four weeks before when you get more into summer i start there sometimes you use a um, use the epsom salts sometimes i use a fish fish oil fertilizer yeah. I bought that. I bought that uh, one of the, the Jobins or the Jobins uh, fertilizer when the plants were in the trays. Mm -hmm. I've been using that a little bit, and and it doesn't burn them, but it does perk them up. I see them jump. Oh meat. yeah, yeah, it really does. Yeah. So uh, that was Nicole's suggestion, folks. I got to go. I got an early morning tomorrow. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Thank you for uh, you too. your information. Take care. Thanks. Take, Take care. care. We have a few lead identification requests, but does anybody else have, have any other questions that they wanted to get, make sure get us asked today? Michael, I just wanted to say hi real quick to everyone. Um, my name's Joe, sorry I joined late. I'll try to, no <laughs> it's a better time for me. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see you guys next time. Just wanted to say who this face is on this video. <laughs> Welcome. All right, thanks for joining us, take care. Yeah. Weeds. Weeds. Let's start with weed number one. I'm getting so old, I can't see. Is that mugwort, maybe? Yeah, it's in the mugwort family. It's a nasty one. Some, some people say, don't pull a weed until you know what it's doing there and and I'm and I live in reality where <laughs> there isn't too much going on to be, but if somebody has mugwort growing what is that a sign of any ideas this particular weed I happen to know if you get I never used to have this and I had a big space down by the the old Elm Street um, car lot that they I have mulch wood chips brought in and this arrived in the wood chips and it's invasive it has runners I don't know that's mugwort but it's in that family and you want to get rid of it and we have it in the community garden now and that's also where we get wood chips from from the DPW but yeah, as you say, Michael, yes, every weed does represent something like a, the soil is too acidic or, or dry or clay or, and again, most of these weeds do have some medicinal or uh, edible value. And I, I really should study them a lot more if I was a forager. The, I'm sure I would uh, greatly appreciate these weeds a little more than, than I do currently. The Chinese word for acupuncture is actually two words. One is needle and the other is um, moxibustion which is made from this herb. So they, they dry it and they make it into like a cigar 
shape and then um, they'll like burn it over points. And so that's actually in Chinese, that's half of the word for acupuncture is, is, is using that. Probably, it may be a specific kind of mugwort. And just because uh, Chinese people use it for acupuncture doesn't mean you necessarily want it spend it sending a lot of runners all through your garden. Right. Up everywhere. Um, yeah, these are my beautiful weeds. Um, I have more this year than ever before. I did get um, composted manure from Sweetman's and um, I still have a lot left over, but the pile that's sitting there is just covered in weeds. So maybe it wasn't the best idea because I did put it down all over my garden uh, early on and I have a huge crop of weeds. <laughs> Now, if those, if she has a big pile and is covered with weeds, does that mean put a tarp on it, put some sort of mulch on it, something to stop those weeds? So sort of basically try to make it, you know, put it aside for next year and keep it covered or something to keep weeds down. Is, there, is that a long-term um, or, or it, anyone? Yeah, I don't, I, I'm buying very few things these days, but yes, I thought I should cover it in some way to kill the weeds. So one, problem, one, one problem you do have is that weed seeds, for example, can last for many years. Mm -hmm. And so just because you get rid of the weeds one year doesn't mean you're not going to get them back the next year, unfortunately. What about weed number two? What is that one? No, I'm so bad. Looks healthy. Yeah. It is. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is. Mm. Yeah, hi. This um, I'm very inexperienced in gardening, but uh, I remember last week I was um, wondering what the heck is growing in my garden. Uh, should I tear it out, or is it actually a good thing? Like. Uh, um i don't know uh rosemary and um i i found some apps online that you know you can take a picture of, of, of what you're doing and i was just recently just right now as we're talking trying to find a trying to find the the name of the app that you know you take a picture of it and uh it tells you what what the plant is so mm -hmm. i i know this is a cliche but uh you know there's an app out there for this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's, there's also a Facebook page, I'm told, that um, if you upload it, somebody in the world will recognize it right away. That there's a Facebook group for, for, for identifying plants. Mm -hmm. Another really good resource is Rutgers University. Mo several universities have online resources for weeds, and Rutgers has a pretty good one where if just type in um, weeds of the Northeast Rutgers, and it's a database, but it has little thumbprint pictures, so you don't have to go through identifying by the by the leaf, shape, leaf, and all that. It's pretty thorough, and it's a good way to figure out what your weed is. Um, I I studied a little bit of permaculture last year with Kelly, and I don't even think she let me use the word weed because it had a negative connotation. Exactly. And she, you know, I mean, she was speaking of the ground cover that <laughs> had just appeared, but she did, you know, uh, make me very aware that I shouldn't just randomly pull everything out, that sometimes I don't mulch a lot, so maybe it was better to leave things. Um, I mean, obviously if the weed is, growing right next to my vegetable or you know i realize the vegetable will grow and not have enough room but are there real disadvantages to having weeds in my garden because it would save me a lot of time not pulling them all out well again a weed is a term of something you don't need you know if you utilize everything you know there's a girl there's a woman who lives in green and uh, her name is joanne she pretty much grows weeds and, and you know, you, 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 you know, she knows all the medicinal qualities of them. Some of them are edible. So 
right yeah. you know something something you don't people consider something we don't want you know if you if really want to use every purpose and that's you know that would be something to look into and study you can make you know tinctures you can make teas no that's not me <laughs> right so then then you just then you get then you got to pull them out <laughs> then you just got to pull them out yeah because they they could uh they just take over they're incredible how they could grow like so fast and take over and run underground and all these things and of course the oldest, right, but, song, the oldest song in the book is if you're you're weeding with a friend and they're saying you know they pull something up and you say oh don't pull that oh yeah I've, I've killed many good plants when i right. we, you know you start weeding you get on a, on a roll and you're like oh crap i just pulled my <laughs> and that, that, that's heartbreaking because there's something i was just growing for like three months i just pulled it out but yeah, be, you know, be I, yeah, rule, I think uh, when i see something coming up i don't know what it is a lot of times i let it i let it mature until it gets to a point where i can definitely uh identify it with a with a bloom or a blossom and then I research it because sometimes, like everyone said, there's some weeds that are okay, but you have to be careful because they usually are able to grow much better than our vegetables and they self seed. So if you let them reproduce, you'll have a, you know, they'll take resources from your other plants. It's kind of a touchy, you know, figure it out as you go along, if you like it or not. <laughs> Yeah. But you know, but for instance, I had an area near the back that wasn't really great for growing anything, and and these things kept on coming up. And I looked it up, and it was milkweed. And mm -hmm. I saw I saw how important it was. And you know, right. I was getting ready to cut it all down. And my wife's like, "Get rid of that." And right. now, I now I encourage it to grow because it's it's kind of an area where nothing. It's pretty shaded. It, I have some a lot of tree trunks there, so it's like perfect. So that worked out. But otherwise, like Stephen was saying, I guess. You know, once you pull them, then you want to you know use mulch or suppress them or cover the area so you could kind of suppress more weeds from coming out. Yeah, and I was going to say that if anything, contact a local herbalist to get take them. Like I would love the mugwort um, because it's actually really hard now to find herbs. Oh. Um, a lot of the online resources that we use aren't shipping or they're completely out of everything. So. Make a friend with an herbalist. See, there uh, you go. See, uh, uh, you can have my mug work. <laughs> I would gladly take it all. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was at I, Joanne's property last week and we were harvesting a lot of plantain and stuff. So oh, I, oh, I have oh, a know, lot you, you know of mug work. You know Joanne? <laughs> you have it. Yeah. Yeah, Joanne, like she put on Facebook every day, she's putting something that people consider a weed and she's making yeah. soaps out of it. And, oh, yeah. So, yeah. And so it's, yeah, right. She, she would love to have all this stuff. <laughs> oh, and so, sorry, someone mentioned in the chat, uh, Plant Snap. Camille mentioned is a good right. app. Plant Snap you know, is a I don't know that that's actual mugwort. I just it's in that family. So before you um, decide to use it for medicinal purposes, I would track down what it really is. No, I would. I think it actually looks like motherwort. It's a little hard to see, but it looks like motherwort yeah. to me. What about weed number three here? And we have some other weeds to go on to, so. Yes, Melissa, invite Joanne uh, next time to, she could identify all these. Or well, Ryan probably would've been good too. But I just can't see that. Here, I have to go folks, so anyway, good night, and I'll see all you right. soon. Good night. Thank you. Take care. Oh yeah, wow. It's almost nine, how'd that happen? Mm. Anybody have, anybody know about this weed number three? Let's um we have some others. We have some others. Why don't we look at those? Now the one on the right, we discussed this in the first week, I think. This one on the right, even I recognize. So I'm yes. gonna say this is this is mullen. And yeah. um I let mine go, but if it's near if it's growing near something that you're concerned about, you could take it out. Um but like in parts of my yard where those grow up, I just let them go. I, I call them biodiversity. Uh, it will, later will have a little, um, like a stalk come up and a tiny yellow flower. And um, 
and I think somebody for it mentioned that uh, this can be substituted for toilet paper in an emergency. So <laughs> this has been discussed as a possible need going very, forward. So it could be very valuable. Yeah. Not not the one on the left, probably though. I wouldn't think. Yeah, yeah. Probably not. Probably that would be not. too useful. Okay. So <laughs> what's the one on the left? The thistle. Oh, uh, the Steve Stevens thistle. Yeah. And um, is that, let's see, um, nettles. Somebody told me that nettles are great in a compost heap. Is there anything like that for thistle? I can't think of anything good for thistle. Get it out before it's so big you can't. I just know uh, blessed milk thistle can help lactation, but I don't know if that's what this is. I probably wouldn't give it to a nursing mother though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think those were Sylvia's pictures. Did that answer the question? Yes. Great. Good. Um, oh gosh. I, everyone, does everyone recognize this? Milkweed. Yeah. So, um, and I, I had another picture I was going to get in, but I just didn't uh, take time for that. Um, um, yeah, so if you have milkweed coming up, if it's growing in a plot where it's, where it's not bothering anything else, the, the butterflies will appreciate it you, if you leave it in. Um, let's see. This question we could put off till next week. Does anyone else, I think those are, I think that's about all we have. What about this question? Well, no, we're, we're, we're running, I can save this question for the next time we meet. Does anybody else have some other question we should try to go over tonight? Wonderful herb for lung support, interesting. M Mullen is a herb for lung support, right. Um, yeah, we're gonna have Melissa come by with a big truck and just clear everyone's backyard. Um, dandelion is also good for lung, especially the root. Um, I understand that the the um, people who do ch herbs in China, um, that one of the one of the ingredients that they're using for COVID nineteen is is dandelion, but it's the whole plant, including the root and the and the leaves. Well, dandelion is um, a good herb for a liver detox. Right. So is milk. Tissel, but I didn't know if it was milk tissel or just, but also excellent as a herb tea for um, detoxification. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And just again, Wednesday night, if you want to join us for discussion, please reach out. Or, or if you need to know how to get onto that webinar. Um, e email chat or I, and we will share those details. Um, and there's the thing about container gardening. We can send you those from Nicole. Otherwise, I think um, it's a, this is really a team effort, and we, we pre appreciate everyone participating, people asking questions, people answering questions. Go team. It's really good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank I appreciate you. it. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.